Welcome everybody. Thanks, uh, uh, Igor, for uh, the introduction. Uh, as, as he has said, uh, yeah, I, I mainly, my main activity is now into the, the Nomad project, but uh, this morning I will talk about uh, uh, statistical, mechanical, uh, stati statistical mechanics or computational statistical mechanics, meaning more uh, configurational. Ah, is it switched off? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it better? Yes. No. I don't feel any difference. Do you hear better now? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, right, while on Monday uh, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, um, yeah, machine learning methods and then in the afternoon we will have a tutorial on, uh, on the application of some uh, machine learning methods together with uh, Matthias Rupp. Okay, I don't know if here. Um, okay, let me start with the um, um, scheme uh, that you have seen in different uh, uh, layouts uh, many times, I guess, uh, this, uh, this week, and I think you will see again. That is the usual justification uh, um, or the general uh, embarrassment uh, when we do atomistic calculations then, uh, that uh, we may uh, uh, devote a lot of time in uh, having uh, methods for calculating the potential energy surface to the maximum possible accuracy. But still, uh, we are in a, in a microscopic regime, so uh, very uh, few atoms, typically, if you want a large accuracy, and typically a small time scale, ideally, basically, no time scale at all, if we are just calculating the ground state structure, uh, ground state electronic structure of some uh, configuration of atom. Uh, and typically, in order to understand how the system uh, uh, behaves uh, at, at, at uh, realistic condition, we have to bridge. Uh, to long time scales and larger length scale uh, so that, that are observable. And on the uh, opposite corner of, uh, of our uh, uh, atomistic calculations, we have uh, uh, thermodynamics in which we understand the behavior of a system just with very few variables. On the microscopic regime, uh, we have a kind of full understanding or a full a, a numerical understanding in a way of, of, of a system because we can map uh, the configuration uh, that is, uh, um, let's say, a point uh, living in a 3N dimensional space into a scalar that is energy. That is very nice, except that it's too much information, right? If you want to know what are the stable structures and so on and so forth, typically we want to know uh, less information than uh, the full 3N into uh, one uh, mapping. And if we want to extract things like temperature, pressure, and so on, uh, we, we need to, to find a way to extract this information that is in the potential energy surface, but not uh, readily available. The um, general uh, framework is to go through free energy. So in, in a given uh, equilibrium of the system, and I will not try to debate too much about equilibrium here because it is a very tricky concept. But uh, whenever one can invo invoke uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, uh, the system minimizes the free energy, not the energy. And this is a function of uh, certain variables that I will discuss during the talk. So on one end, you have the potential energy surface. And, uh, and, and there is some machinery to get out the free energy surface. And in any case, it's a reduction of uh, dimensionality. So you go from 3n to few. Uh, and here, when I say potential energy surface can be anything, uh, so it can be ab initio, can be force field, or even toy models. I mean, most of the development of computational statistical mechanics has been done on toy models, where toy models, I mean, like Leonard Jones potential, for example. <coughs> You can find something that behaves like a Leonard Jones potential, but typically you, people use it because it's simple. Um, and the, the ab initio here justifies why the title of the talk is ab initio statistical mechanics. Of course, it's not the property of statistical mechanics itself that is basically ab initio, uh, but the fact that uh, what I'm normally interested in is the statistical mechanics using ab initio potential energy surface. So, more on the side of what can we really do with the, the slowness of uh, potential of ab initio uh, uh, evaluation. 
uh, and still get out uh, a free energy surface. Um, the, the sampling problem itself, so why the sampling on a, of an ab initio potential energy surface is low, uh, and what are the problems related to the, this sampling will be mainly treated by Marianne in the next talk, so she will be talking about ab initio molecular dynamics. Uh, will not really make a, a huge difference between what is good for ab initio and what not. But certainly I, I selected methods uh, that are usable at least in an ab initio context. Uh, okay, this I have already said. So nature minimizes uh, free energy at equilibrium, and this is important in order to understand phase diagrams. At, at equilibrium, uh, each phase uh, has the same chemical potential. So by equating chemical potential, whenever we can calculate chemical, chemical potential of all the, sub, of all the species, then we, we find the, the phase equilibrium, sorry, of, of the phases. Um, also, uh, by knowing free energy, there should be free energy actually here, not energy. Uh, we know also the relative probability to see some structure with respect to another structure. This is most importantly at the nanoscale. Uh, and also, we can have also insight into uh, rate of processes. So this is outside equilibrium, but free energy uh, gives insight also uh, uh, in, into transformation. So namely, a chemical reaction uh, uh, from reactants to products. This is some reaction coordinate. Let's say that this molecule is sticking on these other molecules. So it could be the distance between the center of masses of the two molecules. The, Reaction coordinate, of course, in this case, it should be de decreasing, not increasing, anyway. Um, so uh, one has to uh, overcome a, a so-called free energy barrier, meaning that uh, uh, typically there is an intermediate state that has a higher free energy with respect to the reactant and products. And this is relevant for catalysis because typically people are looking for catalysts that are nothing else than devices, molecular devices, that lower this free energy barrier. Of course, you cannot change the difference in free energy between the reactants and products, because it's defined by the reactants and product themselves. But you can ch change the barrier at will if you understand the mechanism. And the relevant quantity is the free energy. So, so far, so good about free energy. Now, the key thing in free energy is, is uh, entropy, because uh, on, on the side of energy, you have heard a lot. We are pretty good. The, the tricky thing is, is uh, entropy. What is entropy? So this is a kind of uh, slightly provocative slide, or let's say a different way to see something that you have seen for sure in all your uh, basic courses. Uh, so this is the definition of free energy in, uh, in uh, statistical mechanics. Uh, it's the logarithm of the density of state multiplied by a Boltzmann constant. If uh, people were smarter, would have said the, co the Boltzmann constant is 1, and you define free energy. The, the, the entropy as basically the scale in, in, this, in this thing. But for historical reason, we have a constant here. But in any case, it's the logarithm of the density of state. Density of state is the number of state uh, with a certain specific energy uh, and integrated over all the uh, possible configuration of the system that are compatible with this energy. Now, if you rewrite this thing, no, no, if you write the, 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 the first principle uh, uh, in a differential form of thermodynamics, and plug in uh, the, the, the entropy, because the, 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 the DQ is uh, uh, T in DS. And then you write all you, your work as um, a product of, some, uh, of the control variable with the conjugate variable that you can uh, always write for any kind of work that you do on the system. Uh, an example is like uh, uh, you have the pressure that is conjugate to the volume. So the, the work done on the system is a change of volume multiplied by, by the pressure. Now, um, this sum goes uh, over all the degrees of freedom that are, contro that are controlling the, um, the, the, wor the work that is done on the system. What is left is TDS, right? It's uh, what, uh, what, what makes this, this thing uh, uh, differential. Um, now, suppose that you can control all uh, the degrees of freedom. Entropy disappears uh, because you have done, uh, basically you have put uh, something on each degree of freedom and then this sum is, is, is du. So if you, if you control all the degrees of freedom, there is no entropy. So the, the, the entropy is the uh, measure in a way of the uh, lack of information that we have on the system because th that there is some degrees of freedom that we are not interested in 
we are not controlling, and everything goes into the, into, into the entropy. OK, so there are many definitions of, uh, of free energy. And uh, this is not just to remind basic courses, but because normally from each different definition or each different interpretation of, of free energy, uh, there is a method that is connected uh, to this definition in order to, to evaluate it. So of course you have the fundamental uh, uh, link between uh, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. Free energy is minus kT logarithm of the partition function, where the partition function is this integral here. So the Boltzmann factor. Uh, integrated over all momenta and all uh, configurations. Then typically, in classical statistical mechanics, uh, one uh, uh, can uh, uh, do the, the integral over momenta analytically. So this is lambda over uh, to the 3 n power, the de Broglie wavelength. And one is left only with this integral that is typically analytically untreatable. So it's uh, an integral of the exponential of uh, the uh, uh, potential energy integrated over all possible configurations. And this is what we are typically concerned with. Uh, so in thermodynamics, the, the free energy is, is my in, in minus Ts. Simple and good. Uh, actually, if you can uh, in a, uh, take uh, the, the entropic term uh, properly, uh, that's it. You can uh, evaluate the free energy of a system uh, simply. And uh, there is a method that is called uh, ab initio atomistic thermodynamics uh, that actually uh, uses, exploits this fact. So basically with energy and a little bit of uh, uh, reasoning on the system, you get out free energy. Another useful definition of uh, free energy is through uh, its derivatives. So most, uh, many derivatives of free energy are observables of the system. And actually, this is also the way in experiment people would uh, measure differences in free energy. If you can measure the derivative and in integrate, and you know the free energy in some reference state, you can calculate the difference in free energy. Then we have the probabilistic interpretation of free energy. Uh, the probability that you have a state at a certain energy is equal, uh, well, density of states, again, and is equal to this. Uh, term here, so you have the Boltzmann factor, the number, the, the density of states, uh, and uh, this normalization that is the partition function. So this is the probability to get a system at a certain energy, uh, in a state of certain energy E. Um, that has, so the absolute probability is, is difficult to treat because we have this normalization factor that is typically difficult to, to get out. Uh, we will be talk uh, at length about this the partition function. Uh, especially in the last few slides. Uh, the good thing is that uh, the partition function is a property of the system at a certain temperature. Uh, so the probability, the relative probability to be in a state of energy one or uh, with respect to be in a state of energy two is just uh, the ratio, is, is just the, 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 the exponential of the difference of free energies. So uh, this is much more treatable. And you get the, the relative probability to be in one or the other state. This other kind of mysterious slide is, is um, to justify why uh, we talk about a free energy that is the property of a system. So basically, if you are uh, in the uh, canonical ensemble, the system is defined by n, v, and t, uh, number of particle volume and temperature. And that system in that particular triplet of n, v, t has some free energy. You have to give the Hamiltonian of the system, of course. But people also talk about free energy as a function of some variable. Because if you have a, a chemical transformation or something, and you go from one state to the other, you have free energy, and you have this uh, free energy barrier, you have free energy as a function of some uh, coordinate outcomes. Well, it's a bit of stretching of the concept of free energy. So the energy of the system, of the free energy, is a mapping from free end coordinates to one scalar. Energy is a very nice properties, uh, but now, Let's uh, uh, look for, uh, or let's define an, any other mapping from uh, the configuration of the system, so the full 3n uh, uh, vector, uh, into another scalar. You can define the probability that the system has a certain value, uh, theta, I think, <laughs> of this function here. And this is given by this integral. Uh, 
I mean, they always look like the same. You have the Boltzmann factor. You have to impose that the system is in this, uh, uh, this value. So you have the delta, the Dirac delta, integrate over all configurations that are compatible with this value of the variable, and you have the normalization. Now you define this guy here as a new partition function that is a partition function with respect to this uh, 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 function, mapping function here. And you can define also a free energy related to this partition function that looks exactly like the free energy, the, 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 the usual free energy, let's say, the thermodynamic free energy. So, and the probability that you get this is again uh, uh, formally similar to the, the free energy, to, to the probability to get the system in a state of energy E. So by this formal uh, analogy, you say that you have a free energy also with respect to some coordinate. It's a bit subtle. Uh, normally, you don't care, but it's good to see that it, it has a, a, a clear meaning. Other thing that you have in test books is always that uh, when you know the partition function, you know everything about the system, right? So yeah, I just summarize a little bit of what that means. So you have seen already this expression. The average energy of the system is related to the uh, derivative of the logarithm of the partition function. The heat capacity is also, well, is a further derivative with respect to temperature of the energy, so it got, uh, is related to the partition function. These are all observable, so you can, uh, you can measure in, uh, in the system. Or if you know uh, the partition function, you can deduce them. It depends on which way you go. Um, and this is another example. I will not insist too much. Uh, also, the pressure, if you know the partition function, can be evaluated directly. You have first to rewrite the... Uh, the integral uh, with the scale coordinates in order to, to capture the volume dependence. Um, and I put this because what I like is that in, in this definition of the pressure, there are two terms. One term is the ideal gas, and the other depends on the, on the, on the actual interaction. So the pressure is this term here, plus uh, an average, an ensemble average that you measure on the derivatives of, of the potential, so basically on the forces. Uh, so this is the virial. Um, so the nice thing here is that most of the time when you have um, quantities that are derived from the free energy, you have this, uh, this uh, dual thing, the, 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 the ideal gas term and the uh, Hamiltonian uh, potential energy dependent term. And typically, one, you cannot evaluate analytically, but you must sample. The other one, you can evaluate analytically, and typically you cannot sample. <laughs> if you try to get this out of a simulation, uh, you will simulate forever before converging it. Uh, that means basically that you have to throw particle non-interacting in a box and try to measure the pressure of them uh, just by sampling. That's useless, but also it, it would be difficult to, to converge. Now, the... Um, um, the way we sample uh, quantities in one way or the other is, uh, uh, is given by this, uh, well, uh, again, uh, textbook kind of uh, definition of, of, uh, of uh, expectation value of sub-observable. Uh, you have um, uh, the, the, the integral weighted by the Boltzmann factor of the observable and, and normalized by the partition function. Now, the sampling methods are typically based on the fact that you move uh, from one point to, to the other. So you construct a sequence of points such that you sample uh, the system with uh, the, the density that is uh, proportional to, the, to, to its uh, density of state. Um, so that you um, uh, make a, a simple average of something that samples the system uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the density uh, that is uh, proportional to the, the, the density of state of the system um, in order to get uh, the observable, right? So you go from this integral or the, so from this integral to this uh, uh, um, sums to this one that is actually what is sampled, so a simple average. If you can sample with the uh, proper uh, probability density. Actually, I skipped this one. I spent too much time. Uh, this is about the ergodicity, so whether you can go from a sampling over the configuration of space into a time average, but I'm pretty sure Mariana will say something about this. Back to free energy. Um, so these things we can treat, typically uh, simple averages over quantities. 
uh, and, and the trick is that basically the, the, the denominator, the partition function, is, is part of the sampling itself, so we don't care. If we want to address the partition function, we would need to address this integral that is typically untreatable unless we have an ideal gas or a few other systems for which we can calculate it analytically. Um, so we need methods to sample. This is the kind of uh, little zoo that I will present uh, today. Um, different methods uh, spawning from the different uh, definitions of, uh, of free energy. And just to give an overview of what kind of uh, weapons you have in your, uh, uh, at your disposal when you want to, uh, to look for uh, free energy or better difference in free energies. So we have uh, the analytical way of initial atomicity thermodynamics that actually will be uh, uh, object of uh, part of the lecture of Sergei in, on, on Tuesday, so I will not say anything today. Uh, then we have uh, thermodynamic integration from the derivatives, perturbation from the probability definition, and then I will talk a little bit about uh, how to bias uh, the sampling uh, uh, or how to reweight afterwards in unbiased kind of thing. And I will put a stamp of merit uh, um, that I think is, can be useful when methods are inherently parallel uh, uh, in the sense that you can uh, do uh, several independent calculation in order to get your free energy. Uh, they are good. And while you have to kind of do it uh, in sequence, this is less good because, yeah, you are not exploiting the parallelization that is something we, we like to do these days. Uh, so, thermodynamic integration is extremely trivial. You have to start from some known uh, derivative, like the, the derivative of energy with respect to the volume is minus the pressure, uh, or this one, and basically integrate. So the free energy, uh, for example, if you take the, the pressure at a certain volume V, is the free energy at a certain volume V0, plus this integral uh, when you go from V. So what, what you need is, is, is the uh, P expressed uh, as a function of, of the volume in order to do this integral. And this is known as the equation of state, right? So well, this is the density of the volume. But OK, you can me measure these points uh, uh, on, uh, for your system. And then you can get out the difference in free energy. You need a reference state in order to compare this to um, any, uh, another system, for example. And this could be the ideal gas when the V0 is, is, is infinite. Uh, that is doable. Uh, one has to be uh, careful because, of course, this, this thing uh, tends to diverge uh, when you go to infinite volume or to zero, uh, sorry, to zero density. Uh, so we have to be very careful in this, uh, in this part here. Uh, that's not the very interesting part of thermodynamic integration. We can do in, uh, in, in, in computations thermodynamic integration that follows an unphysical path. And typically, this is the most powerful. And physical in the sense that some, or I would say non-experimental or non-empirical, whatever. You cannot real, typically do it in an experiment, but you can do it easily in a simulation. That is, you define a Hamiltonian that is a linear combination of two Hamiltonians, u0 and u1 with a coupling parameter, and you can go from one to the other continuously. Then, OK, this, uh, I try always to write how you derive the thing. Uh, uh, you start from the derivative of this. Uh, um, um, free energy with respect to this coupling uh, parameter here. And it turns out that this difference, uh, OK, the derivative uh, uh, is equal to the um, expectation value of uh, u1 minus u0 in, in the ensemble with the value lambda. That means um, that is fixed the value of lambda. You have a certain u lambda. Uh, but the, uh, the derivative is a function of the uh, values uh, u1 and u0 at each uh, sample point. So you can integrate this one. You need a reference, of course. So your u0 must be uh, a, an Hamiltonian for which uh, you either can calculate analytically the free energy, uh, or you, have, you can find it in some other way uh, from, from, because somebody has done from another u minus 1 to u0, <laughs> and you know already the free energy at u0. Um, this is uh, fundamental to, to have the, 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 the reference, because if you want to do phase equilibria, as I will show in a few slides, you need an absolute uh, reference of free energy. So if you want to calculate the, the, the difference of free energy between the liquid phase and the solid phase, you need that the, uh, the zero of the free energy is the same in the liquid and the solid. So you need to, to have the same, either the same u0 or the same reference. 
I, I, I will show in, in a couple of slides so it becomes more clear. I will show a kind of uh, fully worked out uh, a, a calculation of, of a phase diagram of, uh, of um, uh, one species uh, uh, substance uh, in order to show how you can use thermodynamic integration to get phase diagrams. It's a bit, it's a bit involved, but uh, well, you start the simulation, you sit there, and, and at the end you get the result. There are very few pitfalls, uh, possible pitfalls that you can you have to. Uh, look into. So the, the, the example is uh, about the phase diagram of, uh, of uh, carbon that has uh, diamond, graphite, and, and some liquid phase. Not only, but that was the focus of this uh, work. Um, so the free energy is, uh, is this one from a reference to, uh, uh, to, to, to the final state, where reference is uh, uh, so, so some, some uh, Hamiltonian for which we know the free energy. Um, so for the condensed phase, uh, okay, so this is again uh, the same plot. Uh, we want uh, to go from graphite to diamond and then uh, include also the, the liquid phases. So for the, for the solid, we use the uh, Einstein solid for which we can write the, the free energy and the coupling between uh, the uh, Hamiltonian that we use and the Einstein solid is given by the displacement. Uh, uh, of the uh, of uh, the, the, the atoms in the in the harmonic potential, so one can measure this displacement in the actual potential and then and then find the harmonic spring that does it. Okay, it's a bit of technical detail, just to say that one has to try to couple uh, the system as close as possible. And I show I will show why in in, this, in the next slide. The the, the liquid uh, the, the reference is the Leonard Jones for which we don't know analytically the, the free energy, but uh, people have been looking for free energy of Leonard Jones liquid like for, uh, for decades, so you just go to some of the tables. It's similar to the uh, LDA, separately Adler, so we, we, we don't know the LDA, but somebody has tabulated it, uh, and, and, and there is another paper that is almost as cited as separately Adler for, for Leonard Jones, because everybody does Leonard Jones, and, and you have the equation, uh, the, the, the free energy uh, of, of, of Leonard Jones liquids. Um, so this is the, uh, the thermodynamic integration, or at least the, 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 the uh, derivative, as a function of lambda, uh, uh, when going from, so on, on this side we have uh, the uh, uh, initial, um, so the, the kind of U0 reference uh, uh, Hamiltonian, and this is the final Hamiltonian, don't mind about this name, is some uh, uh, empirical potential that I was using when doing this, uh, this calculation. Um, so the, 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 the constraint or the, the, the requirement that the um, the, 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 cup, the system that is coupled, uh, so this U0 that is coupled to the, 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 the Hamiltonian that you are actually interested in for the free energy, um, uh, comes from the fact that you are uh, uh, co constantly looking uh, at this quantity, U ref minus U final. Uh, so if the, the two systems are very different, by different means, meaning um, that certain configurations uh, with one of the two are completely forbidden, impossible. With, with, with the other one, you get some uh, uh, diverging energy on one of the two sides here that makes everything diverge, right? So the two systems have to be similar in some way. There are ways to check beforehand that they are similar. OK. Now you have the free energy at one specific uh, number of particles, volume, and, uh, and temperature. And then you want to f find the full phase diagram. First of all, you need the free energy as a function of pressure, because most likely you want to equate the chemical potentials that are function of pressure and temperatures. So f to go to, from volume to, uh, to pressure, to change the ensemble, you need the equation of state. And you integrate the equation of state, and you get the free energy as a function of pressure of the three phases. Where they intersect, you have coexistence. So at this pressure, and this pressure, and this pressure, you have coexistence between the three phases. This one is metastable with respect to this other phase, but it doesn't matter. It's still a coexistence. And it is good because from each coexistent point, then you can uh, uh, integrate with the Gibbs duum or clausius caperian uh, So you integrate the, the, the clausius caperian equation that is called Gibbs duum integration. Uh, and you can uh, find the. Uh, um, phase boundaries. This is the bad part. This is, you have to integrate this uh, differential equation numerically, and you have to do it serially. 
because you start from points. So these are the initial point that I had, one, two, three, and then uh, integrate here, integrate here, and integrate here in order to get uh, the full uh, phase diagram. Uh, yeah, compared to some experimental evidence uh, that, that was pretty good. You see, it's quite a long time ago. Um, another way to get the, the um, uh, coexistence without transforming into uh, the, the, the pressure temperature ensemble, staying into, into the volume, so the canonical ensemble, is by looking at the, uh, at the common tangent of the equation of states. So you have the free energy as a function of volume. And where these two guys uh, have the same tangent, uh, you have a coexistence. And, and, where the, and, and, the, and the slope is minus the pressure. So. Uh, and you have seen this already. This was historically the first uh, time a phase diagram was calculated ab initio. Uh, Matthias has shown this, this, this the first day, Ian and Cohen in, in, uh, in 1980. Um, this is at um, zero temperature, so the free energy is actually energy. So you get the coexistence at, at zero temperature. More recently, the same thing was done uh, like in 2013 to get uh, the uh, phase equilibrium of uh, cerium that has a very strange phase diagram with two cubic phases that are stable. Uh, well, stable is debatable because one is a negative pressure, but okay, they are at least numerically stable in, uh, in a calculation. And there are evidences that they exist at least in, uh, uh, at the nanoscale. Um, okay, so. Um, to me, the real fun starts with thermodynamic perturbation because it starts a little bit um, um, manipulating um, the uh, statistical mechanics, uh, kind of very simple equations. And typically, what one does is multiplying by one over and over and see what happens. So um, this, to me, is a very uh, insightful uh, way to define the difference in free energy between two systems. It is also related to a method to actually calculate this difference in free energy. Um, so let's say we have system zero and system one, and you write the partition function for both. As you see, so the, the momenta is, is factored out, and you have the uh, potential energy zero and potential energy one. The, the difference in free energy is related to the logarithm of the ratio of the uh, partition function. So this thing here, where already there is uh, E minus beta U0, E plus beta U0, so there is the multiplication by one. But by doing this uh, uh, simple uh, manipulation, one sees that this difference in energy can be interpreted as what? Uh, the expectation value of this quantity here in the ensemble defined by U0, because you have the Boltzmann factor and the, and the partition function here. So this logarithm of the expectation values of E minus beta delta energy measured in the system zero is the difference in free energy between zero and one. So look again at this uh, expression. Uh, I'm sampling sim uh, system one with its Hamiltonian in some way. So I'm doing molecular dynamics with the Hamiltonian uh, U zero or something else. Um, and at each configuration, or every now and then, it's the same. I sample the difference between this system that I sampling uh, with U0 with some foreign Hamiltonian U1 that is not used for the sampling, but I just sample. What would happen if the system was U1? I collect this, and at the end, I have the difference in free energy between uh, 0 and 1. To me, this is very insightful to see what exactly free energy is, or the difference in free energy is. Um, I think I skip. This is uh, the actual way to. Uh, calculate the difference in free energy by exploiting this thing. And one can measure, for example, the chemical potential of a species. So just uh, 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 the chemical potential is the change of energy, free energy by uh, adding or subtracting uh, uh, one atom to the, to the system. And one can calculate it uh, in, a, in a nice way using this uh, uh, sampling of the system with the other Hamiltonian while you sample with one of the Hamiltonians. Now, one can push further this uh, multiplication by one and discover that one can uh, sample something in one uh, state uh, and uh, obtain information another about another state. Um, and it goes like this. So if you have uh, an expectation value in a certain NVT1, and you write it like this, multiply by some uh, E beta 2, so another temperature, Beta is always 1 over kT. Um, 
above and below. And then you regroup a little bit and then you discover that this is the same as <coughs> being sampling at the temperature T2 and, and, um, and measuring these differences between uh, 1 and 2, right? So you get the thing at T1 by sampling at T2 and, uh, and just by averaging uh, uh, the, the, the quantity that you're actually after multiplied by this uh, factor here. So this is called reweighting. That would be nice if you could always do that, right? You do as one simulation at one temperature and you get the free energy at all other temperatures or the value of the sum property at all other temperatures. Uh, this works, of course, if these uh, things here are significantly different from zero. Otherwise, you have a kind of numerical instability. And these things are significantly different from zero if uh, uh, the states that are sampled, so the configurations, overlap between the two states. So this is, the, this is the probability to get a certain state with a certain energy with a certain temperature, so this thing. So if you want to get information about something that happens at the uh, high temperature, T5, by simulation at T0, and the, the overlap is, is very small, it could be even smaller, then basically this will not work because we have a 0 over 0. Uh, so it will become very unstable numerically. And this gives the suggestion for the next method. Yeah, what if I can kind of bridge things that are not overlapping artificially, but in a way that I can reconstruct? Well, this is called umbrella sampling, because the idea is to bridge two distributions that are not overlapping. Say, well, let's see if I can put some bridging potential, uh, well, I shouldn't say potential now, uh, some bridging device that, that couples the uh, the two distributions. Well, when I want to sample the free energy in, in this way. And there is little overlap here, so I expect that there is numerical instability. So guess what? What I do is multiplying by one. So I start from the probability to get a certain value of a certain coordinate uh, in the system, so the usual uh, thing. And now what the, my one is a, a, a new potential. The difference from before is that now I have an exponential of beta, something that depends on coordinates. It's not anymore like a constant value. Uh, and you get this up and down, rework everything. You get a, a partition function in the new Hamiltonian, u plus w, that is a biasing potential. You see it here. So the probability that the system uh, has a certain value uh, in, in, in uh, there should be a u here, so in, with a certain Hamiltonian u, is related to uh, the probability uh, uh, with the system with a different Hamiltonian uh, reweighted by these two terms here. If you need to have more steps to bridge because your overlap is not still good, this can be parallelized. That is a, a typical method that is used uh, for, for calculating free energies. Uh, the, the only thing that I will show is um, uh, how to construct this uh, uh, biasing potential. So the, if you calculate the free energy out of this probability, you get these terms here, in which you have a constant and the terms that depends on the potential itself. Now, um, the, the best um, uh, solution, the best uh, the, uh, choice for W is that it is equal to minus the, the, the final free energy because basically uh, this probability here would be flat. So you would sample all the configuration with, the, with equal probability. And this is always the best because there is no part of the configurational space that is visited less and has less statistics because the probability to get there is, is, is smaller. Perfect, except that Yes, the, the biasing potential is equal to the minus free energy that is typically the quantity that we want to calculate. So if we knew my F, uh, F we wouldn't need any, any, any method to calculate it. Uh, so there are methods to approximate iteratively this uh, uh, free energy. So when, while you're calculating, you, you change this biasing potential so that you get close to these flat things. Um, now I go to the unbiased methods. Uh, I, I give it a little bit more space relatively to this uh, short lecture, uh, or let's say this compact full course of uh, computational statistical mechanics in one hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I go to non uh, uh, unbiased sampling because, uh, uh, well, I prefer it and I hope I can convince you that it is preferable when you can do it. Um, so, um, the oldest method and still uh, quite used is, is replica exchange. And, uh, and the idea is to simulate the system at different temperatures. The advantage of simulate the system at different temperatures is that when the temperature is low, is low, um, uh, the system samples some uh, uh, like local minimum uh, accurately. The, the disadvantage of low temperature is that uh, most likely it will stay in that local minimum forever. When the system is at high temperature, it can overcome barriers. So when the, the kinetic energy is such that is la larger than any potential energy barrier in the system, it will fly over the barriers. But it will fly too much. So you will not uh, really focus on, on how deep are the minima, because uh, most likely you are here and there and there and then there. You know if these are the lower or, or higher. So you need also to sample at lower temperature. So if we have um, a sampling of the system at different temp temperatures at once, and every now and then we uh, ask to our configuration that is part of the sampling at one temperature, if it can belong to uh, a sampling at another temperature, and we actually exchange configurations between the temperatures according to the probability that uh, the, 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 the configuration can be in the other temperature, then we have a sampling that is canonical, so it's the proper sampling at, at the all temperatures at once. So this is the probability to accept the exchange. It depends on the difference in energy between the subsystem that you want to, between the two configurations that you want to swap and the difference in, temper in inverse temperatures. Uh, if you do this over and over, you get a sampling at all temperatures. Uh, so this would be a different simulation. It can be molecular dynamics, can be other schemes like Monte Carlo that uh, uh, we, we, did, we don't cover in this course. We, you will see kinetic Monte Carlo, but it's not exactly the same. Um, and these are different temperatures. So you run at uh, different, like eight different temperatures. And then at some point, you try to swap between uh, temperatures. And, and, and on and on. So when there is a X year, the, the acceptance has, has, the, the, the swap has been accepted, otherwise not. Uh, and this uh, very complicated plot is to show that if you look from the point of view of configuration and you run this, this uh, algorithm, uh, you will see the, the temperature going uh, fluctuating. It goes up and then down. This is a small snapshot. At the end, it should go up and down many times. So the, the violet one, for example, has gone to the lowest temperature and goes to the highest, and then it should go over and over. Um, there are a few parameters to, uh, to tune. Uh, the efficiency changes slightly when you change this parameter, but the, act, the final result doesn't change. So these are sort of uh, uh, yeah, non-determinant non -determinant parameters. Uh, and, and it's by construction parallel, so very good. What one gets out, out of this? Well, one can reconstruct probabilities a posteriori. Now, OK, this is just uh, uh, to show a little bit one can do it. The, 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 the thing is uh, only in this formula. The probability of get a certain uh, uh, value of, of, of the coordinate of the system uh, in, the, in the simulation one is related to the, uh, the, the overall probability uh, by this reweighting factor. The important point is that this. Uh, coordinate is not decided before the simulation. So you let the system evolve with this natural dynamics. If you use molecular dynamics of its natural uh, uh, sampling, if you use other, other, other uh, sampling. And then you inspect the system and you say, well, let's see what is the difference in free energy between state A and B that you didn't know before the system was run. So the advantage is that you don't put previous information in the system before doing the simulation. While all biased methods, and there is plenty of them out there, require that you have quite some pre-knowledge of the system. And it's never clear how much time you have to spend on acquiring pre-knowledge. So typically, the bias is efficient in getting the actual result. But typically, people forget about how much 
sampling you need in order to get the pre-knowledge before you, get, you put the, the bias. Here you get automatically things. I'm not saying this is necessarily faster. Uh, it will not be. It will be more insightful because you discover things that you have not put in. And to show quickly application that were, have been done in, in, in my group, uh, let's say that we simulate a, a cluster of gold, gold 4, and uh, at, um, um, uh, after the simulation, one sees that these two are predominant structures. And then uh, I decide that the, the variable of control is this angle here, and I get uh, uh, the population at, of the different phases. This plot shows that if I do a simulation at 100 Kelvin, for example, uh, I see the, um, the green dots. So the system lives forever in this basin here, in this uh, local minimum. Uh, if I take out the 100 Kelvin simulation out of the replica exchange, I have visited the, uh, the other structure. This is again the same because, of course, this is periodically repeated. And if you then realize, ah, but there is another structure. So then you can redo the, 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 the reweighting and calculate the probability to get uh, structure 1, 2, and 3 as a function of temperature out of one single simulation in which you didn't know anything uh, before. This is a more involved uh, exercise with the larger gold clusters in which uh, we wanted to understand uh, at which size is the gold cluster undergoes from a 2D to 3D transition. This is uh, quite uh, a, a debated uh, um, uh, topic in, uh, in, uh, in the cluster community. And, uh, and we wanted to spice up the discussion by adding temperature to it, like uh, at what size and temperature the system goes from 2D to 3D. And, uh, and these uh, free energy plots uh, describe the clusters uh, uh, at different uh, size. So this is the same size at two different temperatures. Uh, and and, and the, the coordinates here um, are a bit exotic. So radius of gyration, you know it. Uh, but the second one is a bit exotic. And they were chosen in order to have a, a, a good representation. But why sampling with the replica exchange, we didn't know before. We just looked at how many different clusters were, uh, were present in the, after the simulation. So this is uh, uh, the similarity is by looking at the, how many uh, atoms are twofold, threefold, fourfold, and fivefold. Uh, uh, so you get an histogram of population of the different uh, coordination in the cluster. And, uh, and the histogram can be treated as a vector, so you measure distance between vectors uh, where the reference is the lowest uh, energy cluster uh, of this size that was found during the simulation. So it's a kind of very dynamical and, uh, and, and uh, learning um, um, coordinate. And, and this will be more topic of, of, of uh, Monday's talks, uh, that you can learn uh, descriptors. So the way of describing the system. Here you see that if you know how to describe the system, you can get free energy out of it if you have sampled it properly. And this would be the outcome of this uh, simulation, in which, uh, of this work in which uh, the, the system undergoes a transition from 2D on this side to 3D to this side uh, as a function of a size and as a function of temperature with a very peculiar behavior of size 11 uh, that comes out of the simulation. So uh, I will not insist too much because I want to go to the Last uh, method that is also the latest that has been uh, uh, proposed in literature, so it's not uh, fully established, uh, but it, it is very promising. So at the beginning I said that there is a problem when you want to directly sample the partition function. Um, there is a problem. This method is the first well, there is another method that I, I, I have no time to explain here. The, the, historically, the first method that tries to address directly the uh, partition function uh, um, evaluation is uh, called Wang Landau. Um, and then there is this nested sampling. So I, I had to choose one of the two, and I prefer this one. Um, so starting again from the partition function, let's see how this can be conceptually done, because it's, it's very tricky. Um, so the, the partition function uh, is a function of coordinates here, and then is rewritten as, as a, a density of state uh, weighted by the Boltzmann factor and so on. And now we looked uh, at the cumulative density. It is the integral from minus infinity to certain energy of the density of states. 
Um, and this plot shows, uh, so these are uh, two coordinates of the system. And, and these lines are lines of equal energy. So the density of states is the area between uh, uh, energy and energy plus uh, delta energy, right? So um, evaluating this is still complicated, right? You should need to know uh, how many configurations that are that are compatible with a certain energy, or at least try to estimate them. And this could be. In, in your sampling uh, um, distance, uh, very far away. I mean, two configurations can have the same energy uh, very uh, serendipitously, <laughs> whatever. So, I mean, it, it, there is nothing in, in a configuration that tells immediately what we. So, two, two yes, two, two, two configurations can, can have the same energy. So, it, it's not easy to go from one configuration with one energy to the same configuration with the same energy, uh, or to all of them. But then one noticed that uh, this thing, uh, this object, this uh, uh, cumulative density uh, is by construction uh, monotonic. So it can be inverted. And it turns out that if you look at the uh, inverted quantity, it's much, more, it's much easier to, to evaluate. So this would be uh, the energy of a certain uh, um, yeah, volume of the of the phase space. So we know the limit. Uh, when the energy is infinite, we know the volume of the phase space is the ideal gas. Once again. Now let's say that I I, I uniformly sample uh, the configurations in this uh, uh, system. So I will get points. Uh, at different uh, energies. And if I sample uniformly, and I order the point uh, by energy, and I look at the median, so the point that cuts in, in half the, uh, my distribution, I know that half of the phase space is with the point with low energy, and half of the phase space is in the point with high energy, if I have sampled enough, right? I can iterate this. Now I cut, and I sample uniformly from uh, 0 to the cut energy. This would be the next thing. And again, I look at the median, and I cut. And every time, I know that I am in a half of the phase space in volume. I know the original one, so I know the, the phase phase volume. I know the cumulative density of state. I can do whatever I want. How do I actually do that? Well, I have to. The, the, the first iteration is easy. I sample uniformly because the, the cutoff energy is infinite. Uh, the, the, all the other steps have a cutoff energy, so I have to sample uniformly with this cutoff energy. And that means that I, I need a scheme to do that. And typically, uh, one uses. Uh, a simple scheme. Uh, I, I simulate until I don't cross the, 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 the maximum energy. If I cross it, I, I, I apply a bias to, to go to lowest, lowest energy. If I diffuse long enough, uh, the, the, the sampling is still uh, uniform. But the key thing is that I always sample at lower and lower energy, and I, and I keep track of how many uh, uh, which were the, the energy of this cutoff. This was the uh, one of original application. As you see, the method uh, is fully applied for uh, atomistic potential only last year, so it's very young. And this is a phase diagram of um, um, aluminum with some empirical potential. It doesn't really matter uh, at this point. And the good thing is that it got uh, three solid phases, fluid phase, vapor phase, so the coexistence lines without any pre-knowledge put on the system. This is still quite intensive uh, 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 simulation, but it is the first time that one ob obtains such a phase diagram without any input. So of course, these phases are known, but this was not used as information when, when doing the simulation. OK, so this is uh, the summary where I close. I do not go through again. The only thing I say 
uh, whenever a method is uh, parallel by construction and most of the things that I've shown except the thermodynamic integration, at least the part in which you do the uh, integration of the, uh, of the boundary lines, uh, so all of them are, are parallel. If the system, if the method is parallel, there is good chance you can use it for ab initio simulation in the sense that uh, the problem, okay, you need a lot of CPUs because most likely for each single evaluation you already need uh, uh, quite some uh, CPUs. Uh, but then you can parallelize over it. If you are, can access uh, 1,000, 10,000 CPUs, uh, you, you can get uh, phase diagrams. The problem when it is serial is that you cannot really do it, right? So I'm not just uh, making things easy that are not. If it is parallel, it, it, it is doable. Thank you for your attention.